working on this for some time, and it's, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is part of a larger project, which I've simply called Philosophy of Engineering and the Engineering Worldview, uh, to replace uh, um, Philosophy of Science and the Scientific Worldview. Um, so what I'm, this is kind of a report from the field. I have to make sure I'm going to figure out how the, uh, okay, so here's a little bit of my background. Uh, I've taught at various universities, but I did my undergraduate at Berkeley, and then I went to the University of London. Uh, Paul Feyerabend was my honors thesis advisor. Lakatos was my PhD advisor. And Kuhn and Popper were kind of major players in, in London and so forth. So these are kind of my mentors and, and people in that. But anyway, oh, when they, so I started in philosophy of science. And then I, the, the two things, in, 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 I'll talk about both of them. One is the inadequacy of philosophy of science. So the, the, the description of how science works is wrong and, uh, and increasingly obvious. And then the other thing is the scientific worldview itself is just sort of stupid, you know, like, oh, we don't have any free will at all. So, so there's something wrong with that. But the question is, you know, okay, we see something wrong with it, but how, as Kuhn has pointed out, he said, often we don't, we don't get past things we know are wrong until a new perspective comes along, okay? So we sit there and we say, oh, well, of course we know it's wrong, but. Uh, so I'm gonna concentrate on how did I get into this? And, there are many paths to this, but I want to, uh, I've focused a lot on this guy, Walter Vincenti. He's a, for many years, professor of engineering, uh, particularly aeronautical engineering at Stanford. And uh, so, so modern engineers are seen as taking their knowledge from scientists and by some occasionally dramatic but probably intellectually uninteresting process, using this knowledge to fashion material artifacts. And then he says, engineers so from experience, this is not true. And he has something that says, like, you know, science doesn't tell you how to build an airplane. He said, we love science. That's great. It's nice tools. But it doesn't tell you how to build an airplane. It doesn't tell you how to build a smartphone. It doesn't tell you how to design a city. It doesn't do any of that stuff. So there's something about, there's something unique about engineering knowledge, and it's basically been ignored. And this is what, what uh, Vincenti's doing. He's laid down a challenge. Okay. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is, there's something wrong here. The idea that uh, engineering knowledge is, is, comes from science. And one of the images is that, uh, I'll get to this, is that, you know, engineering is applied science. And there's a whole background to that idea. This is wrong. Actually, science is simply engineering research. Engineering is a larger tent, a larger way to make sense of things. Science is very limited. And that's what I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, so what I'm going to do, so a couple things. Uh, I want to say this idea supersedes to be a concept I'll go into. But what I want to say is that the engineering context, engineering knowledge, is actually the larger framework and what we mean by science is actually very full of idealizations and stuff. So engineering knowledge is going to supersede science. I'll get into that. Uh, and then I'm going to review what I think take to be characteristics of engineering knowledge which is different from scientific knowledge and then this last part the ontology of the engineering worldview. This was actually supposed to be part one and part two. <laughs> Epistemology part one, ontology part two. So uh, but unfortunately Albrecht only let me do one talk so the ontology got left out, so I've kind of rewritten this a little bit uh, in the last couple of days to say to throw some of the ontology in, because uh, you can't talk about what you know about her in the world unless you know what the world is about. I mean, what's out there? You know, what's the furniture of the world, so to speak? So these are not really separable, but I'm going to... Okay, so, uh, and Albrecht wanted me to talk about how, how uh, uh, the relevance of all this. So this guy, Bucciarelli, just started a program called... Uh, the liberal studies of engineering. The basic idea is that in, in most uh, universities, so you have arts and sciences, the big university, and then you have the colleges of, uh, of engineering on the side. Okay, well that's a, so the engineers have been sort of trained as technicians and all sort of, they didn't need to know anything about philosophy or economics or, you know, history, history of Western civilization or anything like that. He's going like, this is a bad idea. And so and a big conference, I think it was a year ago, January, National Academy of Engineering at MIT, Put a big conference, everybody thought it was a great idea, but nobody wanted to move because they had their autonomy, you know, the engineering guy. But the other revelation of the thing was that it's not just that engineering needs to have, um, to be enlightened by philosophy and economics, but philosophy and economics and psychology and all those things need to be enlightened by engineering. That was one of, for me, one of the revelations that came out of this uh, big meeting. Um, so if we're going to bring together. Okay, so. Uh, this idea that engineering subsumes, uh, uh, subsumes just means that anything that works uh, from the re earlier theory is I can explain it, and supersedes usually means that I, I'm going to explain it in a new way. <clears throat> Petro Henry Petrosky has uh, really got out there, his book called The Essential Engineer, quite nice, 
And basically, he says everything that you thought was, uh, was science is actually engineering. Okay, and it's, uh, uh, so look what people are doing. They're doing, you know, engineers presuppose free will, what we're doing. Why are we asking questions if the world's all deterministic? It's ridiculous. So Petrosky actually makes the move and says, it's all engineering. Engineering is the bigger tent. You want to understand what we meant by science, you have to understand it in the context of engineering. Okay, so this, one of my standards that I hold myself to on this, okay, so we're going to do this how we pull it off. It's what we call the correspondence principle. Uh, 20th century Bohr kind of went after this a little bit, uh, but it, it sort of evolved into a more general idea. And the general idea is that any time you make an advance in understanding, the new understanding needs to be able to uh, uh, be able to account for how the old theory, where the old theory worked, when it worked, and also, but yet to understand it in a new way, conceptually new way. So we had the flat earth theory, you know. So once we see the round earth uh, spherical theory, we realize that we're very, very small on a very, very large sphere. So it's, ah, I see why people would have thought the earth was flat. So we go to the spherical earth theory. It explains why the flat earth theory made sense and was valid in certain, still is valid in certain realms. But it doesn't, I don't have to take in the part that if I go over the edge, you know, I'm going to fall off the edge of the earth. So that's kind of, you know, so I'm under, I'm a, understanding the validity of the flatter thing in a new way, that we're little guys in a big sphere. Okay, so that's a kind of a standard. So, uh, and, and this is the same thing. To supersede just means to include all the valid parts of the other one, and, and or to subsume and then sub supersede is to go beyond that. So, and typically what, what's involved in one of these major supersessions like we're, like we're talking about is a, is a paradigm shift, and then that's the Kuhn made this kind of famous. And the basic idea is it's a, it's really discontinuous. So you, you're not gonna, it's not a logical train, okay? So there's a, not a logical sequence to go from the earlier theory to the later theory. The later theory somehow comes about, emerges, and it's able to understand how the other one worked, but it's, there's, a, there's a jump there, a qualitative discontinuity. Uh, so the other thing about this is a simple thing. So uh, it's called a special case relationship. So the flatter theory is a special case within the round earth, okay? And it works in a special, set of deals. So then what we're going to say here in the agenda is that scientific knowledge is based on an idealization, just like the flat earth. Theory. So one way of pointing at the idealization is science has this idea that it's sort of like there's objective reality out here and we're like the spectator on objective reality, detached. You know, we're not messing with it because if we, if we go in there, if our inquiry actually messes with the structure of reality, then we, we, we can't converge. We can't, we're not learning about it, okay? So that's sort of inherent to the the uh, spectators inherent to the, to the uh, thing. And of course, it's wrong. I mean, we are part of reality, so. Uh, the other criteria I'm going to just go over is American pregnancy, Josiah Royce. And Royce says something, uh, he says, whatever, th whatever grand theory you come up with must be able to account for itself. It must be able to account, make sense of itself. And uh, so, so he calls it originally the problem of problems. He says, whatever theory you come up with has to have problems in it. I mean, it's like, you know, deterministic theories don't have problems. There's just stuff happens, you know. So, so what, what he's saying is, is that any theory that you come up with long term needs to be able to be able to make sense of the idea of inquiry, for instance, and, and problem solving and learning and things like that. And basically deterministic science doesn't, doesn't cut it in that line. So, but that's one of the, so I'm holding myself to that standard. So whatever we come up with in engineering, it needs to be able, to, needs to be self-referentially coherent. So it needs to see us in. Uh, so okay. So real quick, what what is it that stimulated us to move? I mean, me to move from science and philosophy, science into engineering. Okay. And the first thing I kind of started out as a physicist, and uh, the new physics, just quantum theory, you know, like the quantum situation. You know, like, what did Feynman say to you know anyone who thinks they uh, understand quantum theory simply hasn't studied it long enough. Uh, so it's a really weird situation, and and. Uh, Two things about it, we have that, you know, we have, it's sort of like we have two objectivities, we have two realities, we have the particle reality and we have the wave reality, and, and yet all of them have both of them, and yet particle and wave, particles are non-waves and waves are non-particles. Particles are local, waves are distributed, they don't, they, they don't, they're not, there's no common denominator there. So when you make a decision to, to set up the two slit experiment one way or set it up another way, uh, you're, you're a participant, you're making, so measurement, observation, you know, whatever theory I come up with is going to be uh, somehow dependent upon how I'm looking at the world. Okay, so I look at the world one way, I see one order. I look at it another way, I see another order. There's no common denominator to those orders. 
So all of a sudden, we don't have that objective idea of one universal order. So, uh, so this pushes us to go for a post-scientific, post-objectivist theory of knowledge. That was one of the deals. Uh, just, just a couple things. De Broglie says, you know, all measurements, all systems have both particle and wave aspects. Uh, reality is more ample than can be captured by any one objective conception. You can even feel like Hegel, he said the same stuff way earlier. Uh, Heisenberg, the deal is that the uncertainty doesn't go away. Okay, so whatever learning is happening, it's not, <laughs> we're not reducing the uncertainty. Okay? That's not what's happening. Uh, what's happening is it's actually expanding and, and uh, we're getting new questions, new types of questions. And, but anyway, so any individual conception of reality is an idealization, is limited. Uh, Bohr, so I think so. Bohr's colleagues would come to him, and this is his, his uh, coat of arms uh, the yin yang diagram in the middle, not too surprising. Uh, Maybe you read Friedrich Capra's deal. So anyway, there are, uh, so his friends say, well, okay, what, what is quantum reality? You know, like I, you know, Newton decided it was a, it was a clockwork or something like that. And uh, so he says, no, there is no scientific reality. No, there isn't, it's not there. There's no, that an, that's not answerable. It's an undecidable question. Get over it. Didn't like that. Uh, at least one, as I was saying. In 2010, he says, yeah, I entered uh, physics in the 60s as one of the second generation quantum physicists. We were intent on solving the question, what is reality, for the first generation failed. He's just talking to an incoming group of graduate students. He says, now 2010 has become rather Kafkaesque. We've made no progress whatsoever. And they're still struggling. But so you know what Kafka is. The guy woke up and found he's a cockroach. <laughs> so a couple of good people that I like. Uh, well, one of this guy, uh, Jim Baggett, who's written quite a bit as a, a British uh, science writer, physicist. Writer. This is a great book if you want to just like, what is the state of physics right now? I mean, without the bullshit, okay? It's funny, we know this, we don't know that, we know this, okay, it's very good. And then he goes, he says like, what's going on now? What's going on since quantum theory? He calls it fairy tale physics. They just feel just make stuff up, you know? They, oh, it solves that problem, it doesn't solve the other problem, but it's a, you know, what And string theory, I mean, come on, this is just the emperor's new clothes. You know, only if you are have you know a PhD and you work for Brian Greene, you know maybe you can see the string. You know, like so it's, it's just a, it's a game. And I, I talked, I know Brian pretty well. I'm talking about it. And he's just like, well. <laughs> so the other step. So uh, we get kicked out of this uh, looking for something new out of the physics itself, but he also got kicked out of philosophy of science. So what happened was the logical positive idea was that science is very systematic and it's logical. Or, Part of the assumption was that, just kind of coming from Galileo, that, that reality is governed by you know, this mathematical order. And we say a, a logical mathematical order is it. So, that became logical. so if that was true, if the world is me mechanical, then science ought to operate very systematically. Okay? So Kuhn comes up and goes like, yeah, but if you look at history of science, that's not happening. Okay, there's these discontinuities, these discontinuous steps, which are called revolutions, that are going on. And I can't go into this totally, but it's uh, so. Oh, and the other thing, Popper raises this thing about falsification. And part of it I call it Popper's question. Uh, you know, he said any all meaningful theories must be falsifiable. Okay, well that's not just falsifiable in the abstract. It means falsifiable, actually falsifiable, which means that all real theories, however successful they are, have some theory, some other counter theory, which I say complementary theory, which is not <coughs> uh, that way. I can't, that's enough of that stuff. So anyway, there were two steps there. So uh, John Dewey, American pragmatist, really lays out this thing. There are two representations of inquiry. And uh, one is called the spectator. Uh, and the spectator's question is, how does the world work? It's how does the world out there work? Okay. And uh, kind of like we're not in the picture. And the other one is called the participant. And once you go to this participant thing, which the quantum theory throws you there, and so does philosophy of science. Hmm, how we look at the world is not one way, okay? So, so it changes the question. If you're inside the universe, then you are messing with the universe as you act. So you're not converging at all. So, so and the question then becomes how to work in the world, okay? Now, if, so this is a little pitch here. So uh, this is my book, Sal, it's been about, about a month. And, uh, and it's, it's basically it's a dialogue between myself and Stephen Hawking. I put on this lecture series, so I've like organized like 25 lectures for Stephen Hawking. This is about the first four uh, uh, back in the 90s, and, and 
he and I are talking about all this sort of stuff. And the, the uh, tension of the thing is, who's the real Stephen Hawking? Is he a spectator trying to find this, or is he a participant? And we have a meeting with students with disabilities and all sorts of stuff. So it's kind of like, you know, I wouldn't ask that question if you didn't figure out what I just kind of answer it. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's also, it's, a, it's more of a monologue about me going through my experience with the physics and my experience with the philosophy of science and how those things have led me to evolve to the position I'm in there. Okay. So, I'm going to go back. So all this about reality and particles and waves, I don't know, like, what's reality? I don't know. So I'm going to go back to Vincenti. Where is Vincenti? You know, where are the airplanes? And uh, where, you know, like the idea that the physicists are going to, you know, come up with airplanes and self, you know, like not happening. And where is civilization and modern agriculture and the Tesla and so forth? I don't see any of that stuff in the physics guys. Okay, so uh, I want to make just, these are things I'm working on. I mean, each one of these could be a, a presentation. So first of all, since the question now for the participant is how to work in the world, how to work in the world. All the answers are methods. We've seen this before. It's central to, central to pragmatism. Richard Rorty came up, said the same thing. What, work, what knowledge is, is about methods. It's about ways of doing things and ways of living. Okay? So, internet knowledge is different. Facts change. Okay? So, if you're looking for the, the ultimate facts of the world, get over it. They're not there. Okay. So number two, uh, the thing about so uh, and this is kind of Kuhn's thing. Where he's observing, he's seeing that the, as knowledge gain, uh, grows, it's 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 growing in sort of discontinu logically discontinuous ways. It's just jumping forward. And this is what happens with inventions. You can have the inventions of the 1950s. How much do they help you predict the inventions of 2010? Not nah. inventions somehow are emergent. So these whatever it is that engineering learning is discovering seems to come forth in a funny way. It comes forth like, you know, magic. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, well, I want to say it, it's conceptually emergent. And that simply means that, that the concepts that I have of, of how the world, you know, I mean, the scientific tools I have on an engineer, and then I come up with something new, it's actually conceptually new. So it's not, there's no, there's no logic between it. The inventions come up, boom. So they're unpredictable, and, uh, and that's just sort of, common sense. Uh, the other thing I think somebody else talked about this. Well. So because uncertainty is always there, okay, everything I do, I, there's an existential, a continental existential thing like here. I always used to say, what is existential? Well, it's sort of like realizing that you have the ability to work in the world, but you don't have any script. You don't know what to do. This goes back to the Greeks and all that sort of like, we don't have any forth, forethought, uh, foresight. You know, we don't have no foresight. So how do we, how do we discover these new <coughs> wonderful things? Well. I don't know. It's not a question that, I mean, it's not an unapproachable question, but to some extent you need to realize that it's open-ended. Okay, so, uh, anyway, so it, basically it requires experimentation and exploration. Okay. And, you know, a lot of that is not stuff that goes on in the lab. Uh, the uncertainty doesn't decline, it transforms, so it's that existential thing. So it means that everything I'm doing in the world is to some extent an experiment. Because I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, like, I'm going to figure out how to do this this way. Good luck, you know, because everything you're doing is an experiment. And, and, the, and the uncertainty doesn't decline, it simply transforms. Okay, so we get new questions, we get new types of questions. Okay, finally, the engineering knowledge, uh, it has a history, okay, and it seems to be cumulative in some sense. So, although I can't derive the new technology from the old technology. Somehow by using the old technology, I'm able to explore and experiment in new ways that lead me to maybe have a new, new idea. So uh, engineering knowledge is cumulative and it's expansive. I think it's, it's, uh, it's emergent is the word we're using. You know, it's coming out. Okay? So it's not, it's not this convergence to fixed reality. It's like this. Okay? Uh, I call it recursively enabling. You know, I, I don't know why I came up with that term, but just, uh, just means that each one must go. So, uh, so I'm seeing knowledge is manifest. So it's not just that, so as participants, we're, we're uh, engineering knowledge, we're doing stuff with it. We're changing the world. We, we change the rivers and we build buildings and we're doing it, we're manifesting reality. So we're, uh, we're doing things. And, and uh, so the knowledge is somehow embodied, instantiated, it's there, okay? It's not something that we're, you know, so to speak, discovering, we're actually 
building. So, and I want to just distinguish between you know, my friend John Barrow has this great book called The Book of Nothing. In mechanics, the classical founda metaphysical foundations of, of modern science, everything adds up to zero. Take all the motion and all the charge in the universe. You ever wonder why all the charge in the universe adds up to zero? All the motion adds up to zero? Because of the symmetry principle. You see it in Newton, you know, action reaction principle. There's this fundamental symmetry uh, uh, assumed in, in science and mechanics. And it's, another way to say it is that uh, uh, whatever the order is, it is time, space, invariant. Is one of the expressions we use. So this is the same order at the beginning of the universe, the same order now, it's the same order at the end of the universe, same order here, same order there, and so forth. So, uh, and that leads you to the symmetry, and it adds up. You actually don't have any universe. Okay? I talked to John about this. You guys see a Woody Allen movie where he, where he says, uh, He's worried that the universe is expanding and that New York is expanding or something like that. And he's really worried about this. And, and I asked John about this. I said, gee, you know, like, does zero of them? I said, should I be worried that the universe doesn't exist? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> but it's basically that's a, an aspect of science. OK, and so, and so uh, OK, so here's the other. So this is where you're getting the engineering. You guys, Saudi Carnot, we getting thermodynamics and so forth. The Saudi, what I call Saudi Carnot's epiphany is that we're engineers in a world of engineering. Okay, we're doing things, but other things are doing things. I mean, plants are doing things, and all sorts of so that's you call that. And uh, and this is and if you take Royce's thing again, take it a little further. Royce realized like, okay, if we're learning about the world, then you guys are learning about me. I'm learning about you. So we got a world of learning. So the world is actually a, 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 where the engineers are learning. They're learning how to do things in the world. So learning is one of these self-referential coherence things that we're involved in. Uh, and I'm going to just run through this. You know, where does all this lead? So one of the arguments here, because once you buy into this, once you drink the Kool-Aid, you got the whole thing. So, so the idea is, so biological evolution is a, is a recursively enabling engineering process, okay? It doesn't, it's not, there's no exact plan, but it's, you know, it, it builds on itself, it explores, experiments. It's a great book by a friend of mine, uh, Robert Lee University. So you can get biological <laughs> evolution by natural experiment. So Darwin, it's ridiculous. So basically, this is saying, in, it's, this is what plants do. They're looking around, the experiment, and the symbiogenesis, so forth. Uh, Darwin's is garbage. Uh, he talks about, in particular, adaptability. I don't like the, that part. But basically, what he's saying is that, the, that evolution is, in, is, is gaining its ability to do things. Okay, so that the, the parameter of evolution, so to speak, is increasing capacity uh, to do things. Okay? Uh, life isn't adapting, it's emerging. Life isn't adapting. Get over it. That's a stupid idea. So, okay. So this got me into. Uh, I'm not going to go into this. So Atkin. So wh where this Carnot leads you is into thermodynamics. Okay. So this is my latest. Bleh. And uh, anyway, there's two versions of thermodynamics. One is Boltzmann, which is really based in, in me mechanics, and the other is Carnot. And I was taught that Carnot was kind of an afterthought, you know, like historical thing. And so so he says, oh no, actually. Uh, I mean, he still has both aspects, reflects complementary attitudes and things. So, so you think you get this situation where either Boltzmann is the more general and Carnot's special case, or, other way. okay, so I'm arguing it's the other way. So that engineering thermodynamics is actually the more accurate, more fundamental. Uh, Boltzmann is just full of idealizations. Uh, so these are my heroes, my new heroes. And I was in Paris and I was walking around, I was following Saudi, I had to go to the the Cold Polytechnic. And uh, so uh, I discovered Lazare, who's his father. Today he had written, I keep looking him up, he had written a book in the calculus, 537 page book on the calculus, seven years before Saudi was born. So a lot of people say, oh, started with Saudi? I don't think so, guys. So, and he has this whole thing about the theory of engines. And I'm just, I'm not going to, so if you, uh, my, next thing you on our uh, YouTube site, you can find this. I just gave a talk like two weeks ago about this in much, much more detail. But basically, it says that the world is made up of engines. Okay? We're engines to everything's an engine. So it's the theory of engines and this key idea of losses. So in strictly in mechanics, things are perfect. Okay? Things like that. But in, but in, uh, in uh, Carnot and in engineering work, you always have a loss. Maybe you don't have perpetual motion machines. So going quick. So this is, if you go to the uh, YouTube channel, this is one I gave a few, two weeks ago. It's called the Linus Klein Memorial Lectures. If you did, leave out the memorial, you get Linus's lectures. Go to that, there's a whole bunch of these. And I just posted my uh, great talk. Anyway. So also evolution, this is uh, Dorian Sagan, 
basically they said, okay, oh, let's look at engine. The, the Earth is an engine. Sun is the source. Uh, outer space is a sink. The engine's doing stuff. And that engine evolves. You know, like a new command engine, a watt engine, all these. The engine's evolving. What's it evolving to do? Uh, it's uh, increasing capacity to form, perform work. And this is work in the engineering sense. Think to do things, not just. Okay. So the other guys are really way ahead. And I just, you know, I get embarrassed. I think I'm digging into this stuff. Ah, oh, I found this new stuff. And you always find somebody who's done it before the Odom's uh, uh, thermodynamics biological evolution. Uh, these are other people. Uh, there's a great stuff about original life stuff, these guys. If you look on the website, those things are there. Uh, I don't know if going to work. This is, oh, <laughs> this is a slide from uh, Tim White, uh, who basically says the whole evolution from like Lucy 2.6 million years ago up to who we are now. Why do we look the way we look and so on? Okay, it's all about uh, technology. Uh, this also goes into economics. Economics is an engineering enterprise. Okay, scientific economics, supply and demand always goes to zero, nothing. Uh, this econo uh, engineering economics is actually post-Malthusian. We're actually producing, somebody just said like, uh, the guy, 70 year old UCLA professor was saying, oh, I'm 70 years old, he said, uh, population of the earth has doubled since I was, uh, since I've been around. And the economic output has increased eightfold. Eightfold. This is not uh, this, you know, we're all competing for crap. So, uh, they don't want any questions. But anyway, so real quick, I'm all done. So anyway, Romer makes the big paradigm change, da, 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 what we're doing. There's, these are just other books that are, people can look out later. And uh, the last thing is, is that what engineers are doing, Kant grabs it. He says, what is practical reason about? It's about how we should live. So what engineers are doing are making decisions about how we should live. And, uh, and therefore, the value context of engineering is the moral context, which is it is. And Dewey says that, and there you go. Sorry. <laughs>